Trollord Games. Join the fray. thousand times you'd think uh, ah, fuck. you'd think I had I'd have memorized how to do it by now but clearly I have not how's it going eight to surf <laughs> this is GM's tricks of the trade <laughs> number 90 our 90th GMTT that's pretty crazy to me uh, creeping up towards 100 we're gonna have to do something special for 100 uh, be what in 10 weeks what is this August to October be early November be kind of cool. It'd be kind of a cool show. Uh, today we're plunging back into running games on the fly. I guess that uh, can you can you hear me? Can everybody hear me and see me and all of that goobly goop? Uh, I got off to a rough start today. Uh, I'm, I, I messed up. I messed up, man. I messed up. Good deal. Good. Everything seems to be working. Fixed again, Dr. Pepper in about 30 seconds. <sighs> ah, it's too much on desk. There's literally four things on my desk and it's too much. So we had a tragedy in the troll dens. How's it going, Kill Superior? M5 Epi. I was defrosting one of the one of the many refrigerators and I I now with a hammer and a screwdriver like you want to do. And I drove a, a, a hole into one of the compressor coils and, and all the Freon came out. Uh, I tried to block it with a chunk of ice, but <laughs> that didn't work. And I had no epoxy to smear over it. So uh, the mini fridge is dead. Uh, and I honestly don't know how much... Uh, I don't know how much Freon costs. It's probably more expensive than actually replacing the mini fridge itself, uh, which is just kind of a sad statement, but there, uh, that's what it is. I guess there's Freon in those things. There used to be Freon and stuff. I, I don't know if that's what they still use. Yeah, it's, um, and I was just telling myself, Epi, you know, with, with the, the supply chains for everything being choked off for 150 different reasons, I told myself yesterday, I said, i got to start being careful with the stuff because we don't want to break anything. And then I promptly broke the refrigerator. There you go. What are you going to do? Yeah, we'll see if we can get a, a cleric, uh, as in a mechanic. I guess it wouldn't be a mechanic, would it? it would be a refrigerator repair man to come fix it up. A DMTT 100 should cover a major movie. There you go. That that, <laughs> that would be the best... The best GM tricks of the trade. What movie are we going to cover now? Well, it would almost have to be... What? Excalibur? Conan the Barbarian? Legend would be a huge one. That had a huge impact on everything I've done. Uh, what are some modern ones? I'm sure there's some modern movies that I just can't think of. Alien. <sighs> so you were a bit impatient with guys melting. Yeah, I've never been able to defrost but open. It makes a giant mess... Uh, and I don't want to clean it up, so I just chuck it out, you know, I usually just break it in there, but this one's got different coils. The coils are kind of behind a plastic case in the back or some kind of shit, I don't know, uh, but uh, I ain't working no more. <laughs> it's, got, it's not cooling off anything at this point. The mini fridge is dead. Long live the mini fridge, yes. Now, my mini fridge is still alive. That's the important one. <laughs> That's the one that keeps the Dr. Pepper's my Dr. Pepper is cold, so that is the most uh, in important one. Cast make whole. Uh, I'm not sure what that means, King Cole. <laughs> old King Cole was a merry old soul. You can get a mini fridge at Walmart. Yeah, they're so cheap now, it's ridiculous. I think that if I got, if I went and got the, the Freon and the whatever to hook it up and to patch it, I'd be out more money than just going to buy one, which is a sad statement, I think. On some level, I don't know what level that might be, but uh, uh, it is what it is. So uh, after the evening's cheeseburger, I'm going to be 
uh, heading down in, in quest for a new mini fridge. He accidentally cast a mako. Oh, <laughs> there you go. That that would be that would be nice. Then then we would we would have a refrigerator back. But uh, eh. the ironic thing is, you know, my kids are in and out of college these days. So I I had bought two. My daughter just graduated a few months back, and hers was just sitting there, and I gave it away. And then there was another one floating around for some reason. I don't know why. Um, and I gave that one away, too. And there you go. Two months later, break one. <clears throat> it's back to school time. That's right. And I think I'll get one of those little bitty ones. I got that little bitty one over here. It does really well. That's one of the bigger ones, you know, know four feet tall or something. Whatever. It's not four feet. It's three feet. Whatever the hell it is. That's too big. That's too big. My wife is taking me to Genghis for my birthday. Oh, very cool. Now, Genghis Khan is in... Kublai Khan is in San Francisco. Genghis Khan is in Denver. Is that right? I believe Genghis Khan is in Denver. I used to go... We did about five or six, five or six of those shows in a row. A uh, couple other manufacturers. Uh, it was kind of off the beaten path for most manufacturers, uh, publishers. And so there was three of us. Uh, Todd, Zach, and myself, and we just, we hung out, it was just a great show, absolutely great show. The Maxi Mini Fridge, there you go. A Genghis Grill, oh, wow, not Genghis Khan, there you go. <laughs> Damn it, Evie. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing the Angus, uh, all my people are out, uh, except my youngest, so me and him are going to go to Angus Burgers and get a cheeseburger and fries and a Coke, uh, and that's dinner tonight. I love me some cheeseburgers. And the Maxi Mini Fridge. You could get a freezer, ice cream sandwiches, <laughs> dream circles. <laughs> that would be interesting. Push-ups. I always liked the orange. Orange sherbet was my, my favorite thing to get from the ice cream truck when it would roll through the neighborhood. Uh, it's got the ice cream in the middle and it's surrounded by orange sherbet. I don't know. It's been too many years. We actually used to get an ice cream truck around here up until about five years ago. Some knucklehead thought it was a good idea to start robbing the ice cream trucks wherever they went, so the company quit. They just, I guess they went out of business because I hadn't seen them for <laughs> forever and a day. And those, those poor people were driving the ice cream trucks. How much can they realistically have in that truck? 500 bucks, 600 bucks, I don't know. Uh, it, was, it was just a sad, it was a sad day. <sighs> Insurance becomes too expensive. But ice cream trucks, mini fridges, and everything else aside, we are here for GM's Tricks of the Trade. We are running games on the fly, part two. Uh, last week, I'm Steve Schnault. For those of you who don't know me, those of you just joining us, uh, I am CEO of Toiler Games. I've been playing since 1976, and I started running games in about 1979, 1980. I honestly can't remember. It's been too long. Um, and I mostly run games now, so I'm pretty sad criminals. Yes, robbing ice cream. It's just me, man. I get, you know... Criminals, that's, you know, that's part of their resume. They're criminals, that's what they do. But the ice cream truck, man, all the kids in the summer are wanting, the, you know, the ice cream sandwiches and orange sherbet and whatever. It's just, it's just me, man. It's like in that line from uh, Payback with Mel Gibson when, uh, I think it's Payback, when uh, he shoots one of the criminal suitcases and he's like, that's just me, man. <clears throat> At any rate, Mel Gibson aside, I need the cash and take that down. There you go. <laughs> it's 914 degrees outside, so <laughs> get yourself a bucket of ice cream and run. That that would be well spent money, so you might as well cut out the middle, man, and get the ice cream. I don't know. I don't know. I've always liked the idea of the ice cream truck. I think it's just really, really cool. Uh, and I know that they were huge up until, what, the 80s, and then they died off, and then they kind of made it come back, but I think they've... They've, they've rambled on in whatever direction. Maybe you need an, an armored ice cream car. <laughs> Just got a, a tank turret or whatever. What are those new, uh, the new vehicles that the, uh, I think the Marines have them. I'm not sure if the Army does yet, but the six giant wheels, it's the, it's replacing the Humvee. Uh, it's replacing, uh, yeah, what, like the cut V's gone and the Humvee's gone. And, um, damn it, I can't remember what it is. They're, they're brand new. Just came out in the last four or five years. They look badass. Well, my wife, I'd like one for Christmas, but she didn't give me one for Christmas. I thought about that movie. <laughs> it's a good movie, man. Payback is one of my favorite movies. Mel gets him just, he gets the hell beat out of him all the time. Man robbing the ice cream truck reminds me of the truly awful scene from the 
original assault on Precinct 13 by John Carpenter, shocking violence. <laughs> it's just rude, man. Yeah, we're doing some kind of giveaway today. I think everybody who hears in the stream at the time of the giveaway gets it. I think that's what's happening. Uh, at least that's what's rolling around. How's it going, Bifford? That's rolling around in my head. Uh, so, yeah, the MRAP, that's what it is. I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Uh, it just, it just looks badass. And I'd like to drive one up to Kroger uh, or to Black Angus. Uh, I think that's it. Let me get that. Let me get that picture. Yes, the MRAP. Thing just looks cool. It doesn't have six wheels. I don't know what I was thinking. Uh, so it's got four wheels, but it's just, it's just badass. It'd be, it'd be great to go to Kroger in that. How's it going, Twitchy DM? How are you doing today? We are about to dive into something. I don't know. Tricks of the trade. Good lord. Anyone else enjoying scene eight on Netflix? Since eight, I have not seen that yet. Is it a bloody good movie? I need to dig it out for this weekend. It really is a hard movie. If you're gonna watch Payback, um, just. Be careful. It's rough. <laughs> There's some rough scenes of, of just beating people out of it. Yes, I'm glad you got to see, uh, Thomas, I'm glad you got to see him. That's, uh, that was very cool. I saw the pictures you posted, uh, and that's good. Uh, Davis is good people. You're good people, so it's good to meet on the road occasionally. Uh, and I understand you took him for a boat ride, which is even better. And don't we have some music to discuss? Somewhere in all that, there should be some music that we, we, we should be discussing, you and I. But we'll get to that. We'll get back to that on, on the Facebook chat. All right, so GM's Tricks of the Trade, uh, running games on the fly, number two. Uh, so last week, just to do a really 30-second recap, uh, last week we discussed five things that you can do. Uh, if you don't have time to prep for a game, you just got to throw something together for whatever reason that is. When you throw it together, uh, uh, we talked about keeping it simple. Uh, do the uh, do it outdoors. Don't do an underground thing. Make sure you have a couple of resources that cover your weaknesses. For me, it's book of names. I always have a book of names uh, near me, and then engage the players as often as you can in role playing, uh, and then have some kind of emotive response somewhere on there so that you're you're kind of keying the players up emotionally, whether it's to rescue a dog or a cat or a monkey or a mule is one of my favorites or a child or whatever it is. Get some kind of emotion rolling into it. And this week, this week we're going to get a little bit more practical, uh, a little bit down to earth on how to run games on the fly. Things I do when I run games on the fly to keep it moving, to eat up time, to make it more interesting, and all of that, all of that bull stuff. Batesville PD here in Arkansas has a surplus MRAT. They enjoy cruising around. Right? <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> I go through Batesville all the time. Tim is up on the river uh, up there, so I'm always popping through Batesville. I'm going to have to I'm gonna have to look for it. <laughs> that is cool. That should be the new. That should be the Troll Lord Convention vehicle. All right, let me close that. Uh, that should be the the Troll Lord Convention vehicle in the MRAP. <laughs> That'd be awesome. All right, so I think we actually touched on GM Strict the Trade number one uh, last week a little bit. One of the things I always do when I'm running a game on the fly is I borrow. I borrow concepts, NPCs, plots, themes, and scenes, uh, and even adventure context from other adventures I've run. <clears throat> this really works well if you're at a table with new players, like at a convention, or family, or whatever it is. You just pull something out you've run before, you know it ran well, so you run it again. You want to tweak it a little bit, change this, change that, especially if they've got if you've got repeat players at the table people who have either been in the adventure or know your style, so tweak it up a little bit, change it, but beg, borrow, and steal from adventures you've run or even if adventures you've been in, uh, take those ideas uh, and, and run with them because they're already fleshed out. You've already, you've already run it or you've already played in it, uh, and now all you got to do is give it a little bit of flesh uh, and get your players to go, and it takes almost no prep to do that. Just a good memory, which I do not have. Uh, but if you've got a good memory, then, <laughs> then number number two might work for you. Apparently, you do not want to speed while driving through Batesville. <laughs> Man, I gotta tell you, Vic and Sparky, you probably realize this. So Batesville is in north central east Arkansas, right? Uh, it's off the beaten path. There's nothing really in Batesville. Well, there's two actual there's two factories in Batesville. It's a pretty small town, and there's the Lion College up there and a couple of the odd mans. But the highways, when you exit, the highways in Arkansas are not something you want to write home about. It's not one of those things that we brag about down here. But the highway from 
really from Bald Knob all the way up to Cave City through Batesville is some of the best highway I have ever been on in any state I've ever been in the Union. I have no idea what's going on in Batesville. But they get such good tar or whatever they make roads out of, but uh, the roads up there are really nice. So speeding is very easy to do. <laughs> make the characters cross river. Absolutely, we're actually... <laughs> We're going to get to that in Trick of the Trade, uh, what is it, uh, number four, I think. But yeah, uh, that's that's the river crossing. Uh, that it, One of the reasons I do the river crossing, and we're going to get that in a minute, is because there's so much that you could do with that. And uh, it's a, it's a, it's, for me, it's a successfully run scenario, so I run it again and again and again. And the nice thing about rivers, uh, lakes, ponds, any body of water is you can constantly change it. You can change it so drastically just three miles down river so if you're describing something and you're not comfortable in that description and you're you're rolling down river a little bit you can completely change it you know the, the sloping banks turn into high bluffs it doesn't matter rivers do that so rivers for me are some of the most dynamic things that a, a gm can do and run with and that's why so many of you <laughs> have plunged into river adventures when i'm running them uh water is just a great thing and we're going to get get into that more here in a few minutes no, it's not very exciting. The highways are great, though. I live west of Batesville in the woods, closer to Mount View. Those curvy roads are fun to drive. Yeah, I gotta tell you, man, that the highways up there are fantastic, and that country where you live is beautiful. It's just absolutely beautiful. I absolutely love it up there. I'm a huge fan of the state of Arkansas, uh, and up in the Batesville area where Sparky's talking about is one of the prettiest parts of the state. Uh, and there's a lot of pretty parts of this state. All right, so number one, Beg, borrow, steal, plead, whatever. Uh, take your adventure from wherever you can get it and, and run it at the table. Number two, and this is crazy important for a lot of us GMs because a lot of us, we're, we're kind of the same. We're cut from the same mold. We we love background. We love to bring in all of these thematic concepts and ideas and, and plot devices and all this. Just throw all that out. Not all of it, but throw most of it out. Go very light on the background. If you're running a game on the fly, don't spend a lot of time even thinking about the background. Just toss it. And don't, don't focus on things that would engender players to, re to look for more from that background. For instance, I think I used an, an example on the Trick of the Trade today. Uh, if you've got them in a caravan going from point A to point B, and point A is a town and point B is a town, don't describe the town. Don't describe point A. Don't describe point B. Just you leave town guiding this caravan. Don't give any political descriptions or cultural descriptions or even, you know, the way people dress or the way the roads are, any of that stuff of the town. Pick that up on the road and describe the road and describe what's next. But go really, really light on the background. Don't even give yourself, don't pin yourself down. Um, don't pin yourself down with, with a, a lot of background on the road itself. You don't even want to make anything up. Just, you're running it on the fly. As soon as you start making stuff up and feeding that descriptive text to that kind of text to the players, they're gonna start asking questions. When they start asking questions, you're gonna to have to start developing more immediately and on the fly, uh, and that gets it just gets progressively harder. Now, as the game goes on, uh, and we'll talk about this later, but as the game goes on, you can actually kind of tweak and add and build uh, as you get breathing space in the game itself. But don't don't. Don't start out with a, a heavy background. Toss it to the side. Uh, I'm going to run Greyhawk in C&C. Me and my friend were talking about how unimportant deep lore is to most players. We're lore history nerds, but most you just live in the mode. <laughs> most do. But most GMs love that stuff. And I'll, and I'll say this. Even the players who only live in the moment, and that's a lot of them, easily half, if not more, uh, that lore will eventually come around to help them. They know it's part of the... The, the whole thing. It's like when you're reading Lord of the Rings and they keep making references to whatever they're making a reference to. Uh, it's not part of, you know, getting the ring to toss it into Mount Doom, but it's there and, and it's noise that they take and they accept. Uh, so if you're running a bigger game and you're building a campaign, you're building all that stuff, I think the lore is important. I think you got you got to at least have it, at least for that one knucklehead who's going to start asking you questions uh, so that you can roll it out. But on the fly by the seat of your pants, uh, the the lore, like you said, it's 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 gonna it's gonna bog you down. <laughs> Don't absolutely do not let it bog you down. Uh, and I want to, yeah, I do absolutely love it. 
Absolutely love it. I, I, I enjoy background material as much as I do the material, and that's at the games, and that's probably why I run as much as I do. I enjoy playing in a game, but I far more enjoy running the game than I, than I do playing in it. And that's not to say that I don't enjoy playing it. I really do. I, I want to throw out there, this is, for those of you who are just joining us, uh, this is GM's Tricks to Trade. This is our 90th, not our 90th show, I don't know, like our 60th show or some craziness. I don't know what it is. Uh, but at any rate, uh, we're just, we, we discuss all kinds of stuff with GMing games, no matter what kind of game, RPG you're playing, whether it's fantasy, science fiction, horror, it doesn't matter. Uh, and any thoughts, concepts, questions you have, throw them into the stream. Uh, we'll all kind of tackle them. There's a lot of experience, you know, in all the GMs here. Uh, and I'll do my best to answer whatever questions you hurl at me. Eventually, at some point during the stream, we're going to start talking about movies. We always do. Um, so, you know, wait for that. So, <laughs> there you go. Can you do a live stream where you describe the top 10 setting aspects that make CNC special? Just a suggestion for episode 91. <laughs> that would be a great. We actually. So, one of the things that we're doing here at Troller Games, we're kind of retooling uh, the way we present the game and whom we're presenting the game to. Castles of Crusades. Uh, still, that's our, for those of you who don't know, that's our flagship product. Uh, it's an RPG that's been publication since 2004. Uh, still kind of runs that gambit of being on the outside, right? And I think that our outreach has not been uh, strong enough over the past decade to get the game to people. And so we, we, we've, I laid down a pretty aggressive plan that we're going to start in a week or so as soon as we get the player's handbook done and the NPC almanac done, which is we're right on the verge of that, uh, so that everybody kind of gets involved and we start pushing those things. And one of those things is to actually start pushing Castles and Crusades and it's the elements of the game uh, that make it so insanely playable. Uh, and it is one crazy playable game. If you haven't played it, you can download the player's handbook on our site right now uh, you, you will find the game is very, it's very familiar if you've played any version of Dungeons and Dragons. CNC is very, very familiar, uh, and it's very, very easy. It's easy to get into, um, and it's easy to manipulate to the way you want it to do. So, they're not in the GM's Tricks of the Trade necessarily, uh, Twitchy, but uh, it's a <laughs> uh, that, that's a great idea for a show. And I think one of the things we're going to add to uh, our Twitch channel here is... Uh, uh, more Castles and Crusades discussions of studies of and actually running the game. Uh, yeah, Bifford, organized play. So that is a huge thing. We, we have tried three times now to get that going over the past 15 years. Each time has failed. Um, each time has failed. We'll just put it at that. And uh, so we, we are... We are looking at that again. Uh, I believe you're working with Chuck on that. And I'm not sure where we are, but again, post Player's Handbook 8th printing, uh, we're going to address all of these things and hopefully get, get that finally going 20 years later. <laughs> 20 years after the, after when we should have gotten it going. Mac Muddles has joined us. Hey, Mac, how's it going, man? I assume you're lumbering north, uh, heading home. We had a good game. We got to get you back at the table, man. We had a good game last night. Uh, Chris is is really bringing the Aristobulus pain to my monsters. He obliterated one in like three melee rounds. I was <laughs> I was having I was having flashbacks from Aristobulus days. <laughs> he just I mean he unloaded the hurt on that on that monster and I fell on my saving throw so I just died. So since it's so similar to D and D, what makes CNC stand out from it? It's actually. So what makes Castles and Crusades, for me, really stand out from Dungeons and Dragons is its uh, versatility and its simplicity. So even 5th edition, as simple as I, I've not played it enough to, to make any kind of judgment one way or the other, but my understanding is that 5th edition has, it, it's a relatively simple game compared to other versions of, of Dungeons and Dragons, but it's still got many, many nuances. For instance, uh, you've got uh, these just a never-ending flow of skills that your characters can have to do things. Well, that's all fine and good, and that's a great way to play, but in Castle, Castles of Crusades, you don't have that. You have attribute checks. So basically, you can do and try almost anything your brain comes up with, and the CK has, through the Siege Engine, he has a, she has, he has, whoever has a mechanic that they can resolve what you're trying to do. Uh, you can build background into your characters, which uh, gives you bonuses on these attribute checks. You can, there's thousands of things that you can do. 
with the game if you want to. Now the CK may not want any of that, but you certainly could do it. So it's versatility for whatever style of play that you enjoy. Uh, heavy role playing, heavy background, uh, all combat, whatever it is, uh, CNC brings that to the table uh, just with ease. And once you start running Castles and Crusades, this is what I've found from those people who switch, once you start running CNC, uh, you'll find out, you'll begin after about the sixth game, maybe the fifth game, depending on how kind of into mechanics you get, you'll find out that the system is so very, very versatile that uh, you can mold it, you can mold these attribute checks, this seed engine, without changing the mechanic, you can mold it to your style of play so that your players and you are actually playing the game that you want to play and not the game that uh, the designers, either whether it's Mac or Davis or myself or people at Wizards of the Coast or uh, whoever else uh, are, are creating. And that, for me, as a, as a DM, uh, a CK for, in Castles and Crusades, is priceless. It's absolutely priceless because you can't... Uh, I, I'm, I, I do a lot of freewheeling DMing. I do a lot of um, on-the-fly stuff. And I love, I love when players come at me. I, I, I love it when they do new, creative, different things, all of this stuff, because it, it's, it makes it more enjoyable for me. Uh, and as the players at the table adjusted to the way that you can try anything, concept, and that there was a mechanic to resolve it, um, they, it, it's like an Augusto. And you can see when, when you're running a table, you can see when someone makes that switch, when they go from looking at the player, can I do this, can I swim this river, to I'm going to try to swim this river. I take my armor off to get to make it better for me to swim. Uh, and remember, my background says that I grew up near a fishing village, uh, and I've been practicing swimming, da 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 da, da. Uh, And you go. And one of the things that I did, and there's no rules for this, but one of my players not long ago, they took a, a year off of adventuring to recuperate. And one of the things he said he wants to do was taste tiny amount every day take tiny amounts of type 1 and type 2 poison to make himself uh, resistant to it uh, and he did and I thought that's a cool idea that you know you read about that stuff whatever so and when they commenced adventuring he gets a bonus plus 2 on his saving throw against type 1 and type 2 poison because he's been kind of you know whatever uh, so I love that kind of concept with castles and crusades is so very very easy to bring into your game uh, that's really the big thing right there uh, da, 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 da. What would you? What would be some good one shots to run for organized play? I think uh, Stains Upon the Green, Line of the Ropes, Fantastic Adventure, uh, Vacoon, the first part of the Vacoon. Those would all be really, really good. A zero two uh, would all be really good one shots. Stains Upon the Green is going to be the best if you've got new players because it it's written in such a way that it explains the siege engine as you're going through it. So that one's a really good one. Five E is the most complicated edition of DMD. I'm hearing actually. And I, I, I'm not surprised to hear that. I'm hearing that more and more, that there's so many nuances with the game that it's actually more complicated than, than you realize, uh, which doesn't surprise me. Uh, and that's kind of the nice thing about Castles of Crusades. You can hold up the first printing of the Player's Handbook and what will soon be the eighth printing of the Player's Handbook, and we've not changed the game. It's not any more complicated than it was when we started it, uh, and if you bought the first printing, you're good to go. only thing that's changed is the Barbarian and some names and a monk, I think. CNC feels like OSR are more polished with some modernized elements. CNC actually predates OSR. I think it kind of spurred the OSR movement. A lot of the guys that were in on the playtesting of Castles of Crusades, uh, Matt Finch being the most notable, went on to create the OSR movement afterwards. So CNC has kind of predated all of that stuff. It's kind of nice. Most of my experiences in Sword and Wizardry complete, 1 and 2E. Yeah, Sword and Wizardry is a good game. Of course, I'm a huge AD&D fan, so uh, there's that. Attribute checks promote role play by describing what PC is doing as opposed to the I roll for a percent check. Yeah, that's it. They do. Uh, and it promotes you to solve problems. You, you can actually, okay, I'm going to convince the bartender to do to give me the information. Uh, make, it, make a perception check or whatever that would be in 5th edition. Well, in CNC, you can do that. You can say, make a check. Make a charisma check. Or you can role play. All right, what do you tell? Them? What is it, what is it that you say? And then you can get into more role playing. So however you want to do it, um, it it's not built around the mechanic. The mechanic there is to, to help you do what you want to do. So uh, in, in that regard, I think uh, people who enjoy who enjoy owning their own table will enjoy Castles and Crusades. Uh, sounds interesting. So you could give an example of how you can mold it, like a specific example. Well, that a, a perfect example is like I just said. 
Um, uh, another one would be, so um, your character grew up next to a river, you're 17 years old, you're a first level fighter, you're gonna get a plus one on any check that involves swimming, holding your breath, uh, getting in and out of rivers, uh, rowing a boat, something like that. Anything that has to do with, with uh, the body of water you grew up on, just give yourself a bonus one. And you don't even have to give it to them. Uh, you can actually give it to them in the course of play. Because you you grew up on the river, add a plus one to your thing. Uh, now, you certainly can do that in really any kind of game that you play. But what this does, what CNC does in this regard, is encourages you to create background that will actually help that help you forward that. And there's no, there's nothing in the books anywhere that says you can or can't do it. You just do it. It's, uh, it's really, it's really that simple. You run rivers. Yes, I do love the rivers. The first game I DM'd, one of my players decided she was going to attempt to jump on a warg and tame it. I figured she'd never make the rolls. She did. I kept roll, I kept throwing rolls at her and she kept making them. So in the end, she had a pet warg. There you go. Sometimes the dice go in their favor. It's just the way it is. Especially when challenging Cecilia on the line, absolutely. Ah, that Princess Bride, one of the best movies ever made. It's not complicated at all, it's just got too many options. Uh, but in a way, each server, I think that's where some of the complexity comes from, because um, you get to the point where you don't know what options to include and what don't, and players don't know, especially if you've got people coming in and out of your table. So, uh, it's, it's, I think that's where that comes from. 5e is not the most complicated. 3.5 holds that a title handily. <laughs> People don't play characters. They play skills, feats, and abilities. Uh, yeah, I think that's a huge uh, a huge part of it. Uh, can, Willie says, as a go ahead, Willie. To be fair, it's not 5e. It's that players don't know any other way to play. Well, see, that's the other side to a lot of that is when you're playing games that have rules for everything. And, this, and, and I fell into this as too. When you're playing games and have rules for everything, it's difficult to get out of that mindset. And a perfect example is me. When we were playing, we played AD&D before CNC. Even after CNC released, we were still playing Advanced Dungeons & Dragons until Mac and Davis sat me down and said, listen, we're not playing your games anymore until you run a few sessions of CNC. you got to at least run the game. I said, fine. So we started in a game. We started running it. Uh, and it took me about three sessions, maybe four sessions, to realize how insanely versatile the game was. Uh, and I immediately began to, to roll into it. So... Yeah, and we've not looked back. I've, I don't think we've played AD&D since, and that would have been 2006. Uh, and that's one of those things, and we've all since learned how versatile the game is. And we know, we just kind of instinctively do things that aren't on the character. It's not written down. It's not part of skills, feats, and what have you. I see a huge uh, discussion about 3.5 and 5e uh, unfolding before us. Siege Engine drew my attention because those checks can have real variables. It's not just roll, roll below your strength. If you're breaking down a door, some doors could be hard enough. Yeah, absolutely. There's tons of variables. You can, and you can do, there's no real written rules. There's some guidelines in the player's handbook, but beyond that, there's nothing that tells you how to do it. Uh, you can just do it. Uh, you should write an adventure about traveling in too far away lands and forgetting that you lent your keys to the castle to one of your family. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Bear KTC. That's that is that is true. I had forgotten that the keys to the, <laughs> to the castle are no longer yours. Well, well, luckily El Presidente is up there uh, on the river, <laughs> and you'll be able to get into your into your own home. As someone with extensive experience with all editions of D and D and Castles of Chase, the elevator pitch for CNC is one ideology with a modern sensibility that doesn't intentionally court the OSR, but instead seeks to modernize the original rules. The rules like approach facilitates the locus of control to follow with the players and not with the characters. That is an important but subtle distinction. There you go. Uh, 3.5 is complicated when it comes to the math of combining bonuses. 5e has some of that, but the action bonus action that are not interchangeable aspect and the fact that you need a table the size of an entire page to determine what spells are legal to cast in a certain order allows it to easily take the crown for most complicated. And like Stephen said, then there's the management of the vast number of abilities each class gets at almost every other level. It's just way too much to keep track of. Uh, something incarnate. So technically, a skill could literally be a profession background that encompasses several skills that, which basically would be a modifier whenever you do, you'd be doing things, uh, you you would be doing things, a character is attempting things related to that profession background. Yes, absolutely. So each class has specific skills. Rangers track, thieves, Steve, whatever, <laughs> the pocket, um, and all of that goobly goop. And then races do as well as, you know, dwarves can see on the ground. That happens. So you get your kind of standard stuff that comes with each class. Beyond that, the sky's the limit. You can try anything. Even if you have no, even if I don't have any ability to, to row a canoe, do you row a canoe? Paddle a canoe? <laughs> to paddle a canoe, 
I can still get in a canoe and CNC, make checks, and the CK can immediately kind of devolve. I want to give this person who grew up on a river, has some experience, there's there's a low CL. This person grew up on the desert, has no idea how to do any of this, it's going to be a CL 10, and CL is your challenge level. And the challenge level is completely randomly determined by the castle keeper. So the castle keeper can build all of this stuff in, even as the players build all of this stuff in, uh, and it can be adjusted. And the nice thing about it, and this is the key element that so many people forget, there's guidelines on what attributes to use for various checks and saving those, but that's not written in stone. I frequently will have, if someone's swimming a river, say it's a wizard swimming a river, I'll say, make an intelligence check. Maybe they can use their intelligence to get through the currents of the river better than they can their actual physical dexterity. So as the castle keeper, you can do anything like that that you want. It's just not written in stone, which gives the CK so much fluid power at the table to make things easier, uh, both challenging but easier at the same time. So you have to do it, but you have a tremendously greater chance of succeeding at it or harder, uh, whatever it is. So there's so many things that the CK can do with the Siege Engine. It is a little bit, it, it's a little, it's almost daunting when you get in there, but you learn quickly how fluid the system is and how to roll with it. I certainly did, uh, and I don't like rules at all. I don't like reading any of it. That's why, <laughs> that's why the Siege Engine is so beautiful. I think CC is going to present a nice balance between my players who want simplicity and those who want some 5e-like tricks, like advantages. Yeah, and the nice thing is, and that's funny as you say that, Sparky, because I was literally just looking at this section two days ago, and the Castle Keeper's Guide, and the Player's Handbook is your siege engine and all that stuff, the Castle Keeper's Guide uh, is a giant book filled with options. It's optional rules, optional stuff, extra stuff. Not all of it's options, a lot of it's stats on wagons and boats and the cost of this and the cost of that. Uh, so if you want advantages, we've got that already built in the system at least, at least so that we're giving you guidelines on how to build it. There's so many things in CNC that you can do. It's just wonderful. It's a wonderful game. Can't stay late today, Steve. Got to check out early to go to dinner for 30-something anniversary. Check it out. <laughs> Happy anniversary, really. Thanks for stopping by. <clears throat> uh, and tell uh, tell your better half I said happy anniversary to 30 years. That's pretty cool. CNC encourages players to describe not only what they're trying to do, but how they're trying to do it. Yes, that's a perfect way to put it. Dyson Logos, how's it going, man? Hey, Steven, I've got the CNC uh, basic box set. I uh, line up for my Wednesday night crew. Very cool. We play a single adventure of each different system we play, and then we move on to another game. Basically, the goal is to teach people new games as we go. Player group shifts from game to game, and it has been a really enjoyable to bring these games new and old to players who never got a chance to play them before. That is very cool. For those of you who don't know, Dyson makes some absolutely fantastic maps. Uh, it's got a great Patreon. Uh, I think that's where it all is, uh, on, and he's very active on Twitter. Uh, so check his stuff out. Well, that's a very cool concept, Dyson. I mean, that's that's very cool because um, you know I've recently gotten onto TikTok, and there's so many new players that have never played anything other than 5th edition D&D, which is fine. I was the exact same way back in the 80s. I played AD&D, and I didn't play anything else except Game of the World, which was basically AD&D and, <laughs> you know, modern, the modern world. But uh, uh, that's very cool. That is a very cool thing to do, to kind of bring the, it, it, you know, not even bring the charm, but bring this whatever it is to, to, to gamers. And these people are gamers at the end of the day, right? Uh, I, I have learned, um, having been in this industry for about 20 years now, a little over 20 years, that gamers are, I don't even technically call myself a gamer. I play role-playing games, specifically Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, and now specifically Castles and Crusades. Gamers play multiple bajillions of types of games. Uh, it always boggles my mind. Both of my sons play games like there's no tomorrow, and there's all kinds of games, uh, which is just very cool. You want to know what's complicated? Staying on topic during a TTMG Twitch stream. Yeah, we're way the hell off a of GM straight to the tray. <laughs> I'm blaming Twitchy for this one. He got started on this. <laughs> That's great. Uh, da -da 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 -da. It encourages players to put thought into the backgrounds too. Da -da -da -da. All right, so this is, there's a discussion going on between uh, in Mr. K4 and... King Kofa, we're going <laughs> to let that unfold in the stream. Kicking ass, thanks for asking. That's great. It's good to hear, Dyson. I see CNC has inspired me with more ideas than I have time for. <laughs> That's great. That's good to know. I also like CNC because TLG is here in Arkansas. <laughs> yeah. And I'm a huge fan of Arkansas. That's very cool that you're here, too. Yeah, this, uh, this year, I've run Top Secret, Gazer, Those Dark Places, BXD and D, Cyberpunk 2020, Warhammer RP 1E. Good Lord, that's a lot of games. You've played, you have run more games, Dyson, this year than I have played in my life. <laughs> I've played... AD&D, the little books, the little bitty ones, whatever, I think that's, is that, 
original, uh, whatever, the little bitty books way back in 76. That's what I started with. Then we went to AT&T, Gamma World, Castles of Crusades. I played third edition once, literally once. Mm, I think that's it. Uh, Merc. I played Lord of the Rings. I played Mercs once. <laughs> that's a sad, that's a sad, sad <laughs> it's just a statement on my game. I game in eight groups right now, four weekly and four bi-weekly. I game full-time practice. That is no kidding, you game full-time. That's a huge amount of gaming. But that's very cool. Uh, that is very cool. You know, I, I don't have time these days uh, for whatever gazillion reasons. But uh, uh, back in when I was in college, we gamed just about like that. Three to four nights a week, we gamed. We would meet. I'd get off work sometimes at 11 o'clock from flipping burgers, and we'd start gaming. I mean, we'd just dive right into it. The booklets were complicated as hell, but they don't they didn't have to be it's all in the group. <laughs> I don't really it was just me and Davis. Uh, so I'm not I can't t I can't even remember half of it. I remember dying mostly. <laughs> I lost so many characters. Davis killed so many of my characters. Steve, please let me run 5e for you in a one-off so that you can make more informed statements on the matter. People who are hyper familiar with 5e will be skeptical of your claims if they know you're I'm not claiming anything. <laughs> I was just reading what they are. Uh, what people have told me is that it's complicated, that it's, that it's got more to it than Castles and Crusades to it. More more rules, more whatever, feats, whatever the hell they call them now, skills, I guess. Uh, yeah, I don't, I'm not making a judgment on the game one way or the other. Uh, I don't, I've never played it enough. I've, you know, I've never played it, so I, I can't say whether I'd enjoy it or not. Uh, I can tell you this, Kothar, if it doesn't give me as a GM, as a DM, complete latitude to run the game um, that I'm not going to enjoy. If I've got to stop every two minutes and look something up and create something to respond to something else uh, or to understand this set subset of rules to understand this skill that they're doing, I'm not, I'm not going to enjoy it. Uh, back, one of the reasons, and I shit you not, Mac, Muddles is, Mac Golden is listening to the stream, uh, one of the reasons that the Siege Engine was created, one of the many reasons, but one of the reasons, uh, I was running games back in the day, uh, and I would have the players make checks. Max says, I want to swim the river. I would literally, this was my mechanic that I used, I would look down at my dice, and whatever dice I saw first, I would say, uh, roll a d8. And I would just choose a random number on that d8 that he had to make, <laughs> whether he got across the river or not. I mean, it was that... And Mac hated it. <laughs> he absolutely hated it. He couldn't build anything off of it. Uh, and it is a ridiculous system, but it gave me the freedom to do what I wanted to do as a CK because uh, when I'm running games, it's more story than it is mechanic. And, and I shouldn't say there's not. There's lots of combat that in my table and all that shit. But but all of that said, I'll be happy to play a game of 5e. Absolutely. I, I have no. I have zero <laughs> qualms about playing. I read the 5e PHP and DM guide. I might play in a game, but I have no interest in DMing. Uh, 5e absolutely won't give you that latitude as a GM. 5e is addition for rules lawyers. <laughs> Steven, to be honest, 5e is actually just two mechanics. <laughs> but it, this is funny. we got two completely different opinions of 5th edition. <laughs> That's great. The DM guide for 5e is almost as good as 1e. Uh, CSE is AD&D brought to its logical conclusion. Had the, had the suits not stepped in and started to destroy TSR from the inside out. Yeah, it got wrecked for a variety of reasons. Uh, what's her name? Lorraine was that again. Uh, I think that was it. All right, but I'm going to jump back. We, we, <laughs> I think we're on trigger the trade number three on how to run games on the fly. Uh, so we talked about borrowing games from things that you've run before uh, and go very light on the background when you're setting up this on-the-fly game. And the next thing is to go heavy on the description. So you go light on the background but heavy on the description. So when they leave point A to go to point B, don't give them background on point A or point B, but give them lots of description on the road. Uh, on the forest around the road, the creeks that cut through the road, the embankments, all of this stuff, sky, weather, everything that you can bring in, give them lots of descriptions and give it to them a lot. So when they move four or five miles down, change up, give them a little bit more different description. The, the thick forest thins out, the trees now space out, but you've got this Spanish moss hanging from the trees, you know, whatever it is. So just kind of spread that out. And one of the things that I use for inspiration for that, if I got to throw something together on the fly, I go right to Pinterest and I type in uh, very simple search strings like dark forest, um, bluff, mountainy bluffs, you know, whatever, mountain lake, whatever it is, and then 150 pictures will come up and I'll just go through and looking for something that sounds cool or looks cool that I can now carry to the table and describe. So go heavy on your descriptions. Uh, this, is, this serves a, a host of purposes. 
Now, not only does it give you more context for your game, so that as you're as you're going forward, you'll you'll start to kind of fire up your own imagination and fill in the blanks of this game that you're having to create as you play it. Uh, but it also fires up the players. The more they feel like they can see where they are and taste it and, and smell it and, and all of this stuff, then the more they're going to get into the game and the more they're going to feel like they're part of something that's not just hackneyed together. So go light on the background, heavy on the description. Uh, trick of the trade number four. I missed it. I see they're still, we're still discussing 5e over here, I think. <laughs> After I'm getting the fly, play CNC engine. <laughs> there you go. And that's every edition. It's just harder for the DM to argue with players since there are so many exploitable rules in 5e. Uh, da 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 da. It's all in DM's hands. Yeah, rule zero is a good fallback. It definitely has a lot of crunch, but a few moving parts. Most of the crunch is classes. Uh, there you go. And da 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 da. All right, so <laughs> I think we're, we're simmering down. And really, honestly, uh, a lot of these games, I suspect that if I got into it, if I was running it, I would chop it to pieces. I chopped AD&D to pieces. Um, I don't have to chop CNC to pieces because it's the Siege Engine is all-encompassing. Uh, I mean, it really, there's just not much beyond it. Anyways, uh, so trick of the trade number four. So this is where we get to the, uh, the river crossing. So one of the reasons, so what you want to do, Stephen, you taught me the best way to deal with rules lawyers, nevertheless. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's it. I, I just, yeah, this, you've quoted that, that's interesting. Nevertheless, <laughs> that's not going to happen. It doesn't work that way. Sometimes it works that way, but in this particular instance, it doesn't. I do that stuff all the time. I am constantly changing things, uh, and it, it gets kind of rough. And we've talked about this in other tricks of the trade. It gets kind of rough for players who are new to it uh, because they, they're trying to cast, I don't know, protection from elements, and it doesn't work how they want it, how it says it in the book, and it pisses them off. And I get that. And this is one of the reasons we talk about when, when you're running a game, you try to give, you try to say yes to your players more than you say no. So that when you change something, uh, when you want to change something for effect or story or plot or whatever, they're not pissed off because the last 10 things that they tried worked uh, or worked properly or whatever, but this one changed the way it is. Um, death by River, yes. Uh, <laughs> damn, Jerry. I'm not even going to repeat that. That's, <laughs> that's just me. I have an actual CNC question, I promise. <laughs> From where would you say Creatures of the Indies Far Realm Hell? From the world of air, my guess would be the void. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, now I'm not sure what in D and D far realm is, but most creatures that most of the Valley Raccoon in the in the world of air were created by the All Father. Most of them were created before the world was ever created, so they lingered in the void, and they were just creations of his that he made. He didn't like them, so he, he just tossed them away. You know, oh, that's, this didn't, this magic court, this magic court looks stupid, and he tossed the magic court you know, over his shoulder and off into the whatever. Not at the Manicores, Valor couldn't. But at any rate, so these creatures, so that that type of creatures in the void, and then of course he creates, the, they kept, when he creates the world, these Valor Kun keep drifting to the world and messing things up, so he creates the wall of worlds around it uh, to keep the Valor Kun, the rest of them, out, and they remain in the void. So probably, not completely knowing what the far realm is, probably the void is where that would be. I ask because I like to, it, to try adapting some Spelljammer elements for use in CNC. Yes, then that's definitely the void. I, Far around, yes, definitely void. Once trust is given to the DM and the players, you know, playing a good game. Yeah, that's the big thing. That's the whole, a lot of it. And it takes a few games to do that. Tensor slows the discs <laughs> it stops working, yes. And it dumps the acid on the uh, <laughs> on the magic users, on Grape Ape's head specifically, wherever Grape Ape is. <laughs> He's not in the stream tonight, but wherever he is. Uh, yeah, so, so trigger the trade number four, lots of checks. About whether it's 5e and they've got to make skill checks or whatever they have in 5e or Swords and Wizardry or Dungeon Crawl Classics, and I don't know if they got those games either, or Castles and Crusades or ATD, whatever it is, where, whatever you're doing, have them make lots of interactive checks with the environment. Uh, this has a, both multiple purposes. It engages the players. It passes the book from the, the, the beleaguered CK who's trying to put something together on the fly to the players, and it gives them something to do. They're rolling dice, which players love to do. And uh, it actually, um, that squirrel made me completely lose my thought. <laughs> the squirrel running around there. I'm literally like that, a light in the sky. At any rate, so give them lots of checks to do. Uh, it just engages the players. It makes them feel like they're part of a game, and they are part of the game. Oh, what I was going to say, uh, it makes the game seem less hackneyed, like, you've, like you're just kind of, <laughs> you're kind of assembling it on the fly. 
they feel like that less because they're involved with it. Hence, the river crossing. Uh, I do river crossings because there's so many checks involved. If you've ever gone out into the woods and tried to cross a river, you know that getting off of the bank can be challenging. Walking in the water can be challenging. Uh, it can be cold. It can fill up your boots. You can slip on rocks. You can fall. You can stub your toes. It can cut through your boots. Uh, you, can, you may have to swim. You may be walking in one section, swimming in another section, walking in the next section. Uh, there's so many things that, can, that you can engage players with in the river, not to even to mention combat or whatever, uh, canoes, whatever it is, uh, that the river has over the years become my absolute favorite thing to do when I'm throwing together a game on the fly because I've got so many checks that I can ask the players to do. And at the end of the day, everyone at the table wants to be playing and doing something. They don't want to be sitting there waiting for you to kind of have something happen and crossing the river is them taking action and doing something. It can be deadly, but it doesn't have to be deadly. The river doesn't have to be swollen and overflown and all that crap. It can be, you know, shallow and just rough to get across. So now the river crossing becomes my favorite, but a second favorite is the mountains, you know, climbing, you know, gulches up, down vines, crevices, all kinds of stuff, caves, getting in and out of. So mountains become another one. And a third, and this one's, I really enjoy it, but I don't use it as much because my, my personal experiences have not put me in the environment that often, but swamps. Swamps offer the same thing that rivers and mountains do with the added bonus that you can have monsters almost anywhere. <laughs> you know, they can be hidden in the muck uh, and, and the grind of all of it. So swamps are really cool stuff, but I've just never been in swamps much, so I can't, the descriptive text kind of, I, I, it kind of falls away as I'm trying to jabber about, you know, trying to describe whatever it is. Far Realm is like Deep Space with Azeroth and Cthulhu would dwell. Yep, definitely the Void. Absolutely the Void on that. Do you plan on your upcoming planes game elaborating on the Void in any capacity? Yes, absolutely. So, right now, the nice thing is um, I'm almost done with the Adventure Spellbook. Uh, we're doing the final placement of the Rune Spells, and each of the Rune Spells is tied to a portion of the Cosmos uh, for the most part. The Bone Runes aren't, but quite a few of them are. Uh, and we're fleshing those out for the, runes, for, the, for the rune spells, and that will become the kernel. And you'll see that very soon if you back the player's handbook. That'll become the kernel. It becomes the whole stalk of corn. That, that doesn't sound right. That sounds ridiculous. Anyways, uh, that'll be the core. That becomes the planescapes, and the void is definitely going to be a part of that. And there's so much, there's so much that people who don't play air, they can use the void in their own world. Just, you know, rehang it, whatever. And that's one of the things that we've gone to great pains in air especially with the gods, to give them multiple names so that you can take these gods. And if you've already got a god of war, you can take, uh, I think Gloriana is probably the closest to the god of war. You can take Gloriana and make her, just give her, who was the, who was the Greek guy? Um, Apollo? No. No, Ares. Uh, you can give Ares. You, Gloriana could be called Ares by these people, and you go. Uh, so that's why, and we're going to do the same thing with the planes. The planes are going to have multiple names. The wretched planes, the abyss, you know, all this stuff, uh, so that people feel comfortable doing it. River crossing is a very dynamic event for characters. It is. It's. It's. You know, and, and there's so much that can go wrong, and so much that they can do that when you're crossing a river. It's just. It's just my favorite terrain on on the fly games because it's just so much, and there's danger involved. Unlike well, there's dangers in mountains, I guess, but there's real tangible danger that can get your character killed really quick. Um, so the fifth. Uh, swamps suck, both literally and figuratively, yes. <laughs> I've never really been in one, I don't think. I've driven through them many times. I'm trying to think. I don't think I've ever even hiked through a swamp. You know, I was stationed when I was in the Army. I was stationed in Hawaii. Um, and then, though Hawaii is certainly civilized, there's small sections of Hawaii that still have jungle. And that's where we would go to do, you know, road marches or FTXs or whatever the hell we were doing. So I got just a little bitty, bitty bit of jungle. I got a lot of forest experience in the mountain and stuff. But swamps, I just don't, I don't have that much experience tramping around in swamps. But I love, I love the idea of it. There's, it seems to me that there's so much texture in a swamp, swamp land, a marshland, that for a GM, it would be almost limitless what you could, if you were experienced with it, that you could bring to the table in descriptive text from smells and sights and uh, sounds particularly, <clears throat> all kinds of stuff. Trust me, you haven't missed anything. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, Davis, I've got to get Davis in these streams. You know, he was an archaeologist for years and he did some work in some swamps and he has nothing 
He has nothing kind to say about swamps. <laughs> There's no romantic, uh, you know, I'm pitching it and it's just kind of romanticizing it, but Davis does not romanticize <laughs> swamps at all. That's great. Uh, all right, last, uh, last trick of the trade. Somehow, somehow it's not quite, quite five o'clock and we got to number five here. Um, weird NPC. So while you're doing all of these things, going light on the backing, borrowing from other games, and heavy on the descriptions, you know, having them do lots of checks to get across the river, start concocting an NPC in your head. Just make some kind of NPC that's got some interesting characteristics, and I frequently borrow them. I've met many, many people in my life, and there's many, many characters out there that are just interesting and funny and weird, and all those characteristics that come up from making a human a human. Uh, and I borrow from them all the time. I'll take scraps and bits and pieces of these of these people, and I'll throw them together uh, into an NPC so that at some point in that game that I've, that I've concocted, that on the flight game that I'm putting together while we're playing, this NPC, usually midway because I've had time to kind of put him together, her together, whatever, this NPC comes wandering in, and now you've got uh, a whole new, you've got something as dynamic as the river because now they can interact with this, this individual, whether he's evil or good, it doesn't matter, none of that matters, just someone there that they can role play with and it's interesting and it has quirks or whatever that that just brings a little bit more to the table and engages their curiosity and that's what you want and the NPC doesn't have to have any kind of greater meaning uh, I think the funniest I ever did was I can't remember the gnome's name it's it's in C1 as a talkative gnome and I just based it I needed an NPC I, I didn't have anything and I had I guess recently or whatever been talking to this guy who just never he maybe it was myself he just always talked all the time um, and I thought, this is really cool, and I took this guy's habit, and I just rolled it into this gnome, this fisherman gnome, so when they met the gnome, it's non-stop talking. Uh, I mean, the, the role-playing session was absolutely hilarious. They even got tired of, they got to the point, the players got to the point, that they didn't want to ask the gnome questions, because he wouldn't shut up talking. <laughs> it was really funny. Also, will the Planescape book use the rings of brass as the primary means of plane of travel? Yes, they will. Or would portals make more sense, like the doors were in TSR Planescapes? How about parallels of the range with spell jamming crafts traveling to other worlds, planes, and air using a ship? You could absolutely do that. So the rings of brass are kind of designed that way. Uh, some of them are as small as a ring. You know, you got a tiny little ring, and there's your ring of brass. I believe there's a magic item that have rings of brass in them. Some of them are gigantic. And once you're in the rings of brass, they're actually kind of sized how you see them. So from a DM's perspective, from a CK's perspective, you can do anything you want with those rings of brass and they're clearly not mapped, uh, that, that would be insane. Um, and you, they, you can move them, you can have them come and go, it doesn't matter, they're the roots of the great tree, and they span through the cosmos. Some are small, some are large. So anything that you want to do with that ring of brass, you can do. And the nice thing about it, when you read the, the how-to of it, once a player has entered through a ring, and they know an exit, if they know another ring, all they have to do is think about it, and walk in that direction, and they will get to there sooner rather than later. That's up to the CK, how long it's going to take with the DM. Um, but, uh, so, the Rings of Brass are this absolutely wonderful method of moving through the cosmos uh, that even stretches in the time stream as well. Uh, we're going to mess with that a little bit. We've already messed with it a little bit. If you've picked up uh, Amazing Adventures 5e, which is our 5th edition version of Amazing Adventures, uh, we've done Ends Meet. I wrote Ends Meet, the module, and it's got a Ring of Brass in it that takes you back to Venus, which is aired. Are reviews gone from the TLG online store? I don't see any reviews. Just wondering if it's a glitch. Um, duh, duh. <laughs> Thank you for the subscription, Night 5150. Well, that's concerning, Stadler. No, they should not be gone. <laughs> I'm not sure what. I will have to ask Tim. Uh, Tim, I'm not sure if you're still with us. I know your, your internet connection was very slow, uh, but... I'm told that we no longer have reviews. You know, I, I haven't got any of those emails recently because we get an email notification um, when we get a review. I swear something that's been reviewed. Okay, now I'm looking at them. Um, so they're still there posted, Statler. I'm thinking maybe... I know there's a limit to the number of reviews that the site allows. I think it's 60 or something like that. And our sales have been much higher in these past six months. So it may be just, it may be shutting you out on that end. I don't know. But I'm looking at them. So, but we'll, we'll double check. That's very odd. That's very odd. I don't know. 
Green Lantern, you barely made it. We, we literally just finished up Trick of the Trade number five. Uh, there was a spirited discussion about fifth edition in the midst of it, but um, uh, yeah, you, you definitely made it. No! <laughs> Let me give you a quick recap. So, deeming five Tricks of the Trade for deeming on the fly, bar from trains and games you've done in the past. Uh, go very light on the background, uh, heavy on the description, and lots of do something that requires lots of attribute checks and create a rear NPC to engage the players. There, see, Green Lantern, I roll it all into like one minute. So, <laughs> so there you go. Uh, with Liz <laughs> Got it. <laughs> there you go. With lots of jibber jabber in the middle. We are, I think, um, I only know one minute in. I think we are, when I hit 100, we're going to look into making a book of these GM tricks to trade and put that out. I think that'll be kind of fun. Uh, get them, a, they're organized on the site. I know, uh, I think it's, I can't remember who's organizing. I think that's Bake Sauce. Damn it. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, it'd be kind of cool to have it all in the book. We can reference it very, very quickly. Good stuff. Um, all right, well, I think that's it for Jim's Tricks of the Trade. I think I'm headed off to get a cheeseburger, one trick and a movie review per spread. There you go. <laughs> there you go. I still really just want to do a pop culture, uh, a pop culture strain, just where we talk pop culture. I think that'd be cool. Yeah, it's funny when I'm talking about this stuff, I have, I have more knowledge of it than I think I do, and I'm not trying to set myself as knowledgeable about it because I can't remember half of it. But I've actually watched so much TV and so many movies and and read so many books that there's bits and pieces of it all <laughs> floating around in my head. And very little of it do I have a negative opinion of. It's most things I enjoy at some level. I I would have to really think about a movie. As there was a movie called Blood Rain, I think, that I did not enjoy, though I laughed insanely hard at it, though it wasn't a comedy is the problem. Um, there's very few movies and TV shows that really, you know, I can pick them apart, Sometimes, but I don't care. To, I don't. I don't really give a shit. I don't. I don't. I don't really care what things are. Just don't give a thing. There's a scene in The Walking Dead, which is one of my favorite TV shows, where two groups come together in an alley and they've got a lot of automatic weapons and they're shooting each other and nobody's getting hit. And I was thinking, Jesus, just on the the ricochet alone, <laughs> somebody's going to get hit somewhere. But I don't care. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> I'm an easy audience. Thanks for the fun discussion, guys. Thanks for coming by, Seal Gripper. Thanks for the journal. Uh, thanks. Uh, uh, okay, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Crusader Journal Number One is the uh, theme of a bloody. That's a funny bad movie. Blood Rain. Yeah, it's got. There's a scene in it, King. That if it's the movie I remember, they keep. I can't even remember what it's about. There's vampires, right? And they keep throwing heads at this one guy, and I, it's all I remember about the movie. And the main act, that guy, who's one of the main people, said, quit throwing heads at me or something to that. I just lost it. I completely lost it. I wanted. That was another movie that, that I did not I did not care for, and I don't know why. Uh, but there's so few movies that I don't enjoy. I really enjoy even bad movies. I enjoy bad movies. Uh, and I mean bad as in, you know, they don't have a lot of money or whatever. Uh, but uh, I just like to be entertained. <laughs> I'm, pretty, I'm pretty easy. All right, at any rate, uh, yeah, thanks. Coming by, Sparky. Uh, enjoy the weather up there in Batesville. I think you're getting a break from the heat. Uh, and uh, the rest of you all, thanks for coming by. I sure appreciate it. Uh, this is another GM Tricks of the Trade. We'll be back on Tuesday for Ask Me Anything. Uh, I'm off to get a cheeseburger. You all have a great rest of your week. And uh, stay safe and have a good weekend as well. Thanks, Troll Lords. I'm still working out. Can't type much. <laughs> that one has to go in long shot. Uh, all right, everybody. Uh, take it easy. Y'all have a great rest of your evening. All right, how do I stop this crazy train? There we go.